Good. Okay. Okay. I'll be back. We are ready to go. Welcome to the Holberg Debate. The Holberg Debate is an annual event that is inspired by Ludwig Holberg's Enlightenment ideas and aims to explore pressing issues of our time. The Holberg Debate is organized by the Holberg Prize, which is one of the largest international research prizes in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. I'm Scott Gates, professor at the University of Oslo and research professor at the Peace Research Institute, or PRIO. I'm currently the president of the Peace Science Society, and I'm the editor of two academic journals, the International Area Studies Review and the Journal of Peace Research. My background is in economics and political science. I've written 12 books and published dozens of peer-reviewed academic articles. My most recent books include the forthcoming Fragile Bargains, Civil Conflict and Power Sharing in Africa, co-authored with Kurostom, published by Cambridge University Press, and Limited War in South Asia, 1947 to 2014, co-authored with Kaushik Roy and published in 2018 by Routledge. My research interest topics such as trends in armed conflict, peace building, bureaucratic politics, applied game theory, and democracy. I will moderate today's debate. Let me now introduce our two honorable and distinguished guests. Ambassador John Bolton is an American attorney, diplomat, Republican consultant, and political commentator who served as the 25th United States Ambassador to the United Nations from 2005 to 2006, and the 27th United States National Security Advisor from 2018 to 2019. He has also served in various positions in the U.S. administrations under Presidents George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, and Ronald Reagan. Ambassador Bolton is the author of three books, Surrender is Not an Option, Defending America at the United Nations and Abroad from 2007, How Barack Obama is Endangering Our National Sovereignty and from 2010, and The Room Where It Happened, a White House memoir from 2020 where he describes his time as National Security Advisor for U.S. President Donald Trump from April 2018 to September 2019. Professor Yanis Varoufakis is the member of Greece's parliament and parliamentary leader of the Mera 25, the Greek political party belonging to the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025, Europe's first transnational pan-European movement. Previously, he served as Greece's finance minister during the first six months of 2015 as a member of Syriza, and he led negotiations with Greece's creditors during the government debt crisis. Varoufakis has taught economics at the universities of East Anglia, Cambridge, Sydney, Glasgow, Texas, and Athens, where he still holds a chair in political economy and economic theory. He also holds several honorary professorships, he is an author of a number of best-selling books, including Adults in the Room, My Battle with Europe's Deep Establishment from 2017, Talking to My Daughter About the Economy, A Brief History of Capitalism, also published in English in 2017, and The Weak Suffer What They Must, Europe, Austerity, and the Threat to Global Stability from 2016. His latest book is Another Now, Dispatches from an Alternative Present, written in 2020. Professor Varoufakis and Professor Ambassador Bolton share many experiences. For one, they both became globally renowned for standing up against large, powerful international organizations. Of course, those being the EU and the UN, respectively. 
They both fought fiercely to protect what they regarded to be in their own countries and the world's best interest. They're both dedicated public servants. They're both articulate and intelligent advocates of their respective worldviews. This is where their differences become evident, which we shall see in today's debate. The topic of our debate is, is global stability a pipe dream? Global stability certainly is not the way one would describe 2020. The pandemic rages. The online nature of this debate stands in testimony to that. In addition to the pandemic, armed conflict persists or has begun anew in different parts of the world. International tensions are growing. The threat of economic instability and insecurity is palpable. Is there a path towards regional and global stability? We look forward to hearing Ambassador Bolton and Professor Varoufakis discuss challenges. The Holberg debate is an open forum, and you in the online audience are welcome to tweet questions by using the hashtag Holberg2020. Please, Ambassador Bolton, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today, even if only uh, virtually. Uh, and it's a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, to be a participant. I thought, uh, from my perspective, uh, although I think the answer to the debate question is uh, quite easy, uh, it is a pipe. Global stability is a pipe dream. Uh, that that the the, the most uh, interesting thing to do first would be to talk about some of the threats to that stability, at least as I see it from the perspective of the United States. And I'd like to distinguish between uh, threats at the strategic level, uh, which uh, are long term and necessarily complex. Uh, and threats at the more immediate level, which uh, are uh, more imminent, uh, some would say more dangerous in the short term, no less complex in their origins or their, uh, their effects, but which tend to crowd out the more strategic questions, which I think is always dangerous. But at the strategic level, I think there are two principal global threats to the United States and, and therefore to global security. Uh, the first is China and the second is Russia. China, I think, is the uh, existential question for the West, for the industrial democracies as a whole uh, during the 21st century. Uh, it is pursuing uh, domestic and international policies that I think are wholly antithetical to our interests and values. Just looking at China domestically, I, I don't, I wouldn't describe it as a communist country anymore. I think it's just a good old fashioned, thoroughly authoritarian country uh, for its people. Uh, it's uh, created social metrics so that the state can rate each of its citizens. Uh, it has pursued policies of cultural genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province and its repressed religious freedom uh, throughout China. Uh, as we speak, it is violating the joint Sino-United Kingdom agreement concerning the handover of Hong Kong, which committed Beijing to a 50-year uh, obligation to maintain a one country, two systems policy. Uh, just yesterday, it jailed four of the most significant leaders of the democratic movement in Hong Kong. It's clear, clearly moving uh, to suppress any incipient freedom of thought uh, outside the Communist Party. Uh, and that's just what it does on an average day domestically. Internationally, it's engaged in uh, hostile, near belligerent activity in the East China Sea. Uh, particularly aimed at Taiwan, a thriving democracy uh, just off its coast. Uh, it is uh, in the process of trying to make the South China Sea a province of China. It's actually declared a provincial capital. Uh, it is building air and naval bases uh, that is constructed on islands and rocks and reefs that on a good day are only a few inches above the waterline, uh, attempting to turn what are now international waterways uh, into a Chinese lake. Uh, 
Uh, it has uh, attempted to intimidate countries with which it shares a land border in Southeast Asia, and most recently, just in the past few months, along the line of actual control with India in military clashes. Uh, it is currently building its first blue water navy in 500 years. It has one of the world's uh, largest and most sophisticated cyber warfare programs. It is building area denial and anti-access weaponry to keep uh, navies uh, well away from its coastline. Uh, it is uh, has an active anti-satellite program intended to blind satellites in Earth orbit. Uh, and it has engaged in a uh, substantial buildup of its uh, nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities. Uh, it has attempted to use the rules of a liberal international system uh, entirely to its own advantage, uh, pursuing a mercantilist trade policy within the World Trade Organization. It has weaponized what are apparently commercial uh, companies like Huawei and ZTE, uh, in an effort essentially to take over the fifth generation telecommunication systems being constructed all over the world. Uh, this is not a China that, as some of its advocates have said, is engaged in a peaceful rise uh, to become a responsible stakeholder in world affairs. Uh, the predictions that were made about China uh, after Deng Xiaoping began his significant reforms in the mid-1980s have not come true in the international sphere, uh, as I've described, uh, or in the domestic sphere. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, China has not moved in anything like a more democratic direction. Xi Jinping is the most authoritarian leader of China since Mao Zedong. That's what we confront. And uh, to ignore this reality, uh, I think, is to invite uh, further challenges from China and further threats to international peace and security. Uh, Russia, on the other hand, is a declining country. It's a one-horse economy, uh, oil and natural gas. But since it has uh, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, uh, it's a country that has to be taken quite seriously, and I think we do. Uh, it uh, is under the rule of another authoritarian leader, uh, Vladimir Putin, who I think is playing uh, unfortunately, playing a weak hand very well. He has made it clear he thinks that the collapse of the Soviet Union was what he called uh, about 15 years ago the ge greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Now, uh, I think it was one of the best ways you could imagine to end the 20th century. Putin obviously has a different view, and he's tried to reestablish uh, Russian hegemony in much of the space of the former Soviet Union, uh, as well as trying to reestablish uh, Moscow's influence uh, in throughout the throughout the Middle East. I think how the West uh, handles Russia over the next few years is going to be extraordinarily important, uh, particularly in Europe and the Middle East, but uh, obviously uh, globally as well. And we've just seen in. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in recent months uh, with the turmoil in Belarus uh, and with Russia's uh, active role first in helping to stoke and then in helping to get a ceasefire of the conflict in, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, Russia and China have their own complex dynamic. Perhaps we can explore that uh, in the questions. But these are, uh, I think, at the strategic level for a long, long time ahead. Uh, the major threats that we face and the major threats to global stability. Now, at the more imminent level, I think the two greatest uh, uh, categories of threats are those caused by uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological, uh, and the uh, sometimes related threat of uh, international terrorism. Uh, with respect to the uh, biological and chemical weapons threat. It's often not discussed. It's worth considering and remembering that those weapons are often called the poor man's nuclear weapon. We have seen in the United States and Europe, really around the world, uh, something not dissimilar to what a biological weapons attack could look like uh, in our experience with the coronavirus pandemic. It has demonstrated that we are not prepared. Uh, we have not responded well. We can debate uh, who's responded worse or who's responded better, but at least as the United States approaches 300,000 
deaths estimated from the coronavirus, uh, by whatever standard, it's utterly unacceptable. Uh, but I think, uh, unfortunately, the rogue states of the world, the troublemakers, have seen uh, our reaction to it. And uh, uh, the pursuit of biological weapons, uh, I'm afraid, has become uh, much more uh, something that, uh, that terrorist groups and rogue states alike would be interested in. The nuclear proliferation threat continues uh, in uh, North Korea and Iran especially. Uh, both of these states remain strategically committed to pursuing deliverable nuclear weapons. Uh, and as we wrap up another presidential term in the United States, we can report four more years of failure uh, to stop uh, either North Korea or Iran from uh, achieving the objective that they've been after for so long. Uh, this is the kind of, uh, uh, of uh, depressing uh, development that uh, once led uh, Winston Churchill in the 1930s to talk about what he labeled the confirmed unteachability of mankind. Faced with incipient threats, uh, countries uh, decide not to take significant action. They watch the threats grow. They tell themselves they can handle the threats. They keep telling themselves that right up until the threats become palpable, uh, and then it becomes too late. And the trouble, particularly in the field of nuclear proliferation, of course, is that as each new rogue state gets a nuclear weapons capability uh, or is, sought, is seen to be pursuing it actively, it inspires others to do the same. I would argue that the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, which allowed uh, that regime uh, to continue to pursue uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing, so-called for peaceful purposes, uh, inspired others in the region to pursue their own, quote unquote, peaceful nuclear programs uh, against the day when they would face uh, a nuclear Iran. So proliferation, I think, remains uh, one of the gravest threats that we face, and uh, especially when you consider the possibility of combining it with international terrorism. Uh, th this is something that, uh, that we must continue to be worried about. The wave of radical Islamism that swept over the Middle East, beginning with the Islamic uh, Revolution in Iran in 1979, has not receded. Uh, we see today in Afghanistan the Taliban continuing to make gains, possibly opening that country back up to uh, become a haven for ISIS, al-Qaeda, or other terrorist groups. Uh, across the Middle East, we see Iran supporting uh, terrorist groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthi terrorist in Yemen, uh, and engaged in conventional military activity in Iraq and Syria. Uh, that supports these terrorist activities. We see Libya still engulfed in uh, internecine conflict uh, nearly a decade after the overthrow of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and the, the, uh, in, uh, on the streets of Europe uh, and in America, we still see terrorist activity being undertaken. That last thing any of us want to see is another 9-11, but I am uh, worried that as these conditions continued, uh, in, in the Middle East, unaddressed, unanswered, uh, that uh, we're laying the groundwork for uh, more to come. Uh, and just one last point uh, before I conclude in, in the Western Hemisphere, something obviously of particular interest to the United States. Uh, I am uh, unhappy to have to report that the authoritarian regimes in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba remain in place. Uh, what I once called the Troika of Tyranny, supported by outside forces uh, like Russia, China, and Iran, oppressing their people in the case of Venezuela, driving them to the level where the uh, president of the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross told me uh, uh, last year that uh, having visited Venezuela and visited its hospitals, uh, he said he hadn't seen worse facilities since his last visit to North Korea. This is a great tragedy for the Western Hemisphere, may not be a threat to global peace and security, but it's certainly a dismal uh, uh, picture uh, here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I am um, not as pessimistic, actually, as I sound in the assessment. I think that uh, uh, ultimately, uh, if the industrial democracies uh, retain their cohesion and their will to survive, uh, that all of these threats can be overcome. Uh, but I think anybody who thinks it will be done easily 
uh, and quickly uh, is unfortunately badly mistaken. But thank you very much again for the opportunity to be with you. I look forward to the discussion and to responding to your uh, questions and observations. Thanks again. Thank you, Ambassador Bolton. Um, Professor Varoufakis, can uh, you come in? Hello, the floor is yours. I certainly can, if you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Well, let me begin with uh, a huge thanks to you, Scott, as well as to the organizers of the Holberg debates. I hope that uh, with my contribution, I can stay close to the spirit of uh, Ludwig Holberg and uh, from what I've read, his uh, determination to ensure that each one of us are reminded that within ourselves, we do carry an inner light of reason that can uh, become, when we put all those lights together, uh, a potential uh, uh, bulwark against uh, yeah, collective obfuscation and indeed uh, strategic hysteria, which is unfortunately these days uh, very much in the offing. Uh, the uh, Ambassador Bolton made a distinction to begin with between strategic and short-term sources of instability or types of instability. He will allow me to make a different distinction. Uh, that will inform my um, contribution today or tonight. It's the distinction between primitive instability on the one hand and systematic instability on the other hand. Let me explain what I mean by primitive instability. Uh, any rivalry between uh, superpowers or uh, regional powers that involves um, uh, conflict uh, regarding uh, influence, regarding resources. Uh, this preceded capitalism, it uh, continued later. It even survived after the Second World War with a rivalry between the two major blocs, the Western bloc and the Soviet bloc. Uh, those types of instabilities uh, will probably always be with us and can flourish into something truly evil. I grew up in the 1960s and early 70s in a fascist uh, regime here in Greece, uh, which um, cannot really be explained as a result of a systematic instability. Uh, it, it was a result of a coup d'etat sponsored by the United States, uh, which was utterly unnecessary, even from the perspective of the interests of the United States. If anything, in the end, it damaged the interests of the United States. The language that um, we hear, we heard it just now, um, regarding particular countries that um, a superpower defines as a rogue state. I'm not sure personally <laughs> you'll allow me to say that uh, Saudi Arabia is less of a threat to stability less of a rogue state than Cuba. But this kind of, uh, you know, our SOBs versus others' SOBs, this is part of uh, the uh, milieu which I refer to as um, um, primitive instability. Then there is the systematic instability, which for me is a much greater source of concern, of nightmares, of personal nightmares, and, um, and, and, of, and kind of instability that can act as dynamite in the foundations of our liberal democracies. Uh, it's endogenous instability that I'm, I'm referring to. The kind of instability visited upon the West after the 1929 Wall Street collapse, which we know very well how it percolated into a great depression on both sides of the Atlantic that in Europe in particular bred fascism and Nazism within, endogenously, within the system. Uh, the, the, the climate emergency we're facing is another example of what I refer to as uh, systemic or mainly systematic instability. Now, if you look at the tendencies of the global capitalist economy from the beginning of, or actually the, uh, the middle of the second industrial revolution, the beginning of the 20th century. What we will find, for instance, in the 1910s and the 1920s is something similar to what we saw in the 1990s. A tendency during periods of growth, 
during periods of increasing prosperity, during periods of increasing hope and optimism. A tendency for existing divisions, global divisions between countries that are in a trade surplus and countries that are in a trade deficit. Surplus countries and deficit countries. We see that during the good times, the periods of increasing prosperity and growth, uh, the surpluses and the deficits get larger while GDP grows. But then, at some point, courtesy of this global imbalance which is building up, something happens like Wall Street in 1929, like Wall Street again in 2008, and the bubbles burst. And the moment the, the, moment the bubbles burst, what we have is this phenomenon whereby the burden of adjustment falls disproportionately on the shoulders of the deficit parts of our countries, uh, as well as the deficit nations. And that causes ruptures, greater, um, if you want, uh, divergences, because the deficit countries, which usually are the ones that lack investment and capital goods, are the ones that suffer a, a disproportionate diminution in investment and therefore capital accumulation. And then when you get out of this crisis, of any crisis, the deficit countries become even more embedded in a deficit-generating dynamic and the surplus countries. In other words, the global imbalances that beget instability uh, widen and they get worse. Uh, it was exactly that fear that led the New Dealers um, having had their experience of 1929 and the experience of the, the New Deal in the 1930s. In 1944, the New Dealers in power in um, Washington, D.C., convened the Bretton Woods Conference with one purpose, to create global stability, to annul this tendency of systemic instability of the kind that I have been discussing. Through, effectively, um, a unification of the capitalist West, of the global economy, uh, with uh, a common monetary system, effectively a common currency, which was the dollar, that was the whole point of the fixed exchange rate regime, which they understood, unlike those who supported the gold standard in the 1920s, that to stabilize fixed exchange rates in a world where some are in deficit, others are in surplus, and usually these surpluses and deficits have a tendency, as I said before, to um, balloon. This whole system, in order to become a source of stability, needs to be founded, to be anchored on a surplus recycling mechanism, on a mechanism which federations understand very well, but you need to expand it globally if stability is going to come out of this system. And the linchpin of the global stability of the first two decades after the Second World War of the Bretton Woods system was the American surpluses. America was the only creditor country, the only country that was in surplus in 1944, 45, and later. And it was the intention and practice of those who were um, in command of policy in Washington, D.C effectively, intentionally, not philanthropically, but rationally, to recycle some of the American surpluses to Europe and to Japan in order to stabilize the dollarized global system and therefore to allow it to be a source of stability. And it worked very well. But of course, it was doomed to fail. Because at some point, by the end of the 1960s, America was no longer in surplus. It had slipped into a deficit. And then, within a few years, by the 15th of August 1971, when Richard Nixon famously blew up the Bretton Woods system, we moved into a second period, uh, which is effectively exactly the opposite of the first two, two decades of the Bretton Woods era. American hegemony continues to grow and to grow even faster than it was growing in the 1950s and 60s. But the fundamental difference, um, and I believe this is a point that needs to be made when we're looking at international stability, the fundamental difference was that whereas during the Bretton Woods era, it was American surpluses that were stabilizing global capitalism, 
After the 1970s, and in particular after Paul Volcker's policies at the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and the policies pursued by a sequence of governments, beginning with President Reagan onwards, what we had was the United States effectively put its collective foot on the accelerator and magnified the deficit, both deficits, the twin deficits, the trade deficit and the budget deficit. And that was done intentionally, that was not a failure. And those deficits played a monumental role in expanding American game. And it's the first time in history, in human history, when an empire, a superpower, gets stronger as a result of going deeper into the deficit. That has never happened before. I don't know whether it will happen again, but it was a remarkable historical phenomenon. So the American trade deficit operated from 1980 onwards, still does to a large extent, as a huge vacuum cleaner that sucks into the territory of the United States the net surpluses, the net exports, of countries like Germany, Holland, Japan, and of course later China. Without the trade deficit of the United States, there would be no Chinese industrial revolution. I, wish, I shall put it very bluntly. Uh, and how did the United States pay for this ballooning deficit? Very simple. That's the recycling mechanism that was reversed. 70% of the profits of European exporters, of Japanese exporters, of Saudi exporters, and indeed of Chinese exporters later on, 70% of that profit was recycled through Wall Street. Effectively, it was a tsunami of capital that ended up in Wall Street. Why? Voluntarily, because Wall Street was offering higher uh, rewards, higher returns. And the Wall Street did that because of two things. Firstly, American capitalism uh, essentially maintained lower rates of inflation and higher uh, and lower levels of cost by suppressing average earnings in the blue collar areas of the American labor market and through financialization making it more profitable for capital to flow into Wall Street. Now why am I saying this? Because this period between 1980 and 2008 was a period during which, uh, following the end of Bretton Woods, I can connect this, but I'm not going to um, uh, waste time on this specific point, even though it's an interesting one. That period was also instrumental in bringing down the Soviet Union and adding another billion workers to the capitalist labor market. That period was highly unstable in a way, in, in, in macroeconomic terms, because what was happening was the American trade deficit was getting larger and larger, the American budget deficit and, and the, the federal debt was getting greater and greater. So a mainstream economist could see this as a kind of disequilibrium, as an instability, but at the same time it was stabilizing the world. It was providing German factories, Dutch factories, Italian factories, Japanese factories, and of course Chinese factories with the demand that was necessary to keep capital accumulation going and create effectively what we now know as globalization. But on the back of this tsunami of capital that was going into the city of London and of course Wall Street to finance and to close this loop, Financialization was building houses of cards, which crashed and burned in 2008. Since then, we've moved into the third post-war phase, which is an ominous one. Because while the Federal Reserve in particular, and China, by cranking up their rate of investment, stabilized global capitalism, the Fed and China did it. Let's be clear about this. Who saves capitalism? The Fed and China, I'll say it once more. Um, nevertheless, the mountain ranges of money that was printed by the central banks of the world, especially of the West, and refloated the stock exchanges, the financial markets on the one hand, created immense wealth for those dealing in paper money, in paper titles, while austerity for the many even in the United States, because let's face it, the Obama stimulus package was countered by uh, austerity at the level of the states. That created huge inequalities, which are ripping apart our societies in the United States, 
in Europe. We have a north-south divide in Europe, which is getting bigger and bigger. We have an east-west divide. We have a divide within our communities. And to put it bluntly, I shall use a very simplistic term, but not an unuseful term. We have socialism for the very few and austerity for the many that depresses aggregate demand, which keeps levels of investment very low at a time when liquidity is huge. This, this, continuity, this disparity between having the highest level of savings and liquidity in the history of humanity and the lowest in comparison to liquidity and savings level of investment, especially in things we need like green investments, like good quality green jobs, creates a humongous source of stability for the world. For the world. Now, China has been mentioned by Ambassador Bolton in a very different context to how I'm mentioning it. Let me put it bluntly. I've said this before, I'll say it once again. Without China, there is no possibility of a reproducible, sustainable European Union economy or United States economy. What we now have is a situation where 12 years of stagnation following the 2008 crisis, which saw massive liquidity in financial sectors and very low level of investment, that creates stagnation a kind of perpetual secular stagnation, Larry Summers called, called it, even though I disagree on a lot of things with Larry Summers, on this I think he's right. COVID-19 comes in and what it does, it, it gives another impetus to money printing by central banks, so stock exchanges, you know, effectively leave planet Earth and move into, you know, in, with stratospheric uh, speeds into the cosmos while the real capitalist economy is going from bad to worse. For me, as citizens of the world, as citizens of Europe, that is the source of greatest worry about the systemic instability, which then of course feeds into primitive instability the way I mentioned it before. Now, what do we do about that? That is a very, it is a crucial question. It's the $10 trillion question, if you want to put a sum to it. Um, we can speed up the clash between China and the West, as Ambassador Bolton clearly intends to convince us is necessary. Uh, we can have a new Cold War, which is already in the offing. Or we can find some way of creating a new Bretton Woods that will, will bring together the United States, the European Union and China in order to plan together for the kind of, you know, period that follows the great stagnation, the secular stagnation of the 2008-2020 period with something more palatable with something that does not waste humanity's capacity to end the greatest source of instability, which is outside our immediate remit, but at the same time, it is undoing our capacity to sustain ourselves as a species, and that is climate change. Now, what is the greatest impediment to such a new Bretton Woods where China, the United States, and the European Union can get together? I believe that, unfortunately, and I'm saying this with desperation. The European Union is the, the patient, the global patient at the moment. We don't have a capacity uh, to get together and to plan ahead. We do not have a capacity to effectively become sovereign as a European Union. Europe has never been less sovereign than today. We rely on China for digital technologies, particular 5G and for batteries. And we rely on the United States for our financial stability, as well as for defense. We are headless. The Henry Kissinger line, who do I call if I want to speak to Europe, remains even more powerful than ever. I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have, but let me finish with a hope that we do not make a desert and call it stability. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Varifokas. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Uh, so uh, I think what I'm going to do, I have a number of particular questions regarding your uh, opening statements, but 
rather than confining the debate, I thought I would start and allow you to choose uh, and be a little more free form to begin. Uh, so what central idea uh, that uh, Professor Varoufakis, Varoufakis has made and uh, create a counter argument to that one and then I'll turn uh, to Professor Varoufakis uh, uh, to respond in kind with a central element of yours or to respond to your comments. And then what I'll do after that is I'll go into some particular questions that I think are uh, left unstated and I want to pursue further. Does that sound okay? Well, I'd, I'd be happy to respond. I must say you, you cut out in the middle of what you were asking for, but I'll, I'll assume that what you were saying is uh, uh, to, to respond to something uh, uh, central to what uh, Professor Varoufakis said and and, uh, and give my answer to it. And if I have understood you correctly, I will uh, try and do that That's briefly. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, uh, uh, I, I will I will make an effort here then to do that. Uh, look, I, I it was a fascinating uh, Marxist description of the past uh, hundred years or so of history, and uh, I recognize it well. I don't I don't uh, recognize it happening in the United States. I don't recognize uh, uh, much of the analysis. Uh, I do think there are a lot of uh, negative uh, uh, economic uh, circumstances that the United States faces today uh, uh, caused by uh, uh, erroneous policies we've, we've pursued for, for a long time. And in this country, uh, I consider myself a deficit hawk. I don't like federal government deficits. I don't like the size of the natural debt. Uh, I think that uh, we've, been, we've been going down the wrong road there for a long time, uh, but it's a very difficult one to come back on. I, I think the, uh, the, the importance of economics and in international affairs can't be, can't be doubted, but I'm not a Marxist myself, and I don't buy the argument that everything is based on economics, and as Marx said, that the superstructure that we look at of politics, religion, society, uh, is all based on economic factors. I think uh, it's, a, it's a much more complex uh, uh, analysis that's required. I don't think historical materialism of the Marxist kind really brings you very far. Uh, but I do think that where economics uh, plays a critical role, uh, uh, is, is demonstrated by China, which uh, owes much of its uh, prosperity to uh, four decades of theft of intellectual property from the West as a whole. This is a, a view shared not just by a majority in the United States, but I think uh, across Europe, Japan, Australia, Singapore, pretty much most of the rest of the world. And I think that uh, that's not that's not something that we dreamed up. The Chinese have been doing this with incredible success. I mean, you have to admire them. They steal intellectual property. They don't have to spend money on research and development. They they recreate the product, sell it back into the markets of the producers they stole it from, and undercut them with state subsidies and uh, and insurance that uh, that allow them to come to dominate the market. Uh, I I think we should all press China to give up its policy of stealing intellectual property, but I'm not optimistic they're going to do it. Why, why should they? Uh, it's, a, uh, it's proven a very successful business model for them. So while they're not Marxist anymore, like Professor Varoufakis, uh, they are authoritarians and, and they constitute a threat. And that, that's, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, I guess, for the moment. All right. Thank you. So, Professor Varoufakis, uh, why don't you respond to that and then... Um, I'll also give you a chance to go after a central theme of Ambassador Bolton's. And then what I'm going to do after you're finished is I'm going to go into some particular questions that I'd like to ask. So um, the floor is yours. Scott, Scott, I'm prepared to make a deal with Ambassador Bolton. Um, let's uh, play the ball, not, uh, not the man, shall we? 
because um, it's very easy to descend into um, characterizations. Uh, I came out with a particular analysis. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm, I would be ecstatic to, to, to hear why my analysis is wrong. Now, you want to call it Marxist. Um, it would be a great surprise to most Marxists I know. And indeed, it would be a great surprise to uh, the good American friends I have who are certainly not Marxists, who are actually quite anti-Marxist, and who are very proud of the New Deal tradition. They're very proud of Bretton Woods because it was a time when American leadership led to a global stability that was indeed particularly beneficial. We had you know, the longest period of steady growth, of low inflation, of low unemployment in the United States and everywhere else. And that was a result of the policies that came out of the analysis that I outlined. Now, we can disagree on the analysis, but let's not call each other um, names, like you know, Marxist, Hawk, Dove, and so on, shall we? Because that will make for a much more interesting conversation. On the substance of what Ambassador Bolton said, um, I came out with a particular proposal for a new Bretton Woods that will bring together the United States, the European Union, and China uh, in order to agree new rules on finance, on technological transfers, if you wish, uh, but primarily on how to keep a balance between investment and liquidity provision, which at the moment is completely out of kilter, and therefore, as far as I'm concerned, a threat for global stability. Now, maybe this is not a good idea, uh, but I would like to hear from Ambassador Bolton exactly what kind uh, of alternative he has in mind, except confrontation with China. I believe that in 2015 um, um, he wrote an article about the need to bomb Iran in order to end the Iranian bomb in the New York Times. Do you believe, Ambassador Bolton, that uh, um, some kind of new Cold War that uh, may lead to a hot war is the way to go forward? Do you really believe that China can be put back into its pen um, through confrontation, not through a new Bretton Woods? Is there an alternative to a new Bretton Woods that would not blow up what little global stability we've got left? Thank you. So I, um, I, I'll, I'm going to let you uh, come back a little bit later, and you can choose Ambassador Bolton how you want to respond to his response. But I want to move the debate into some particulars. I'm going to change the direction a little bit and uh, push things a bit. Um, so I guess what I would like to do is I'd like to focus on the notion of stability. To some degree, uh, you're both naturally focusing on two dimensions. Ambassador Bolton naturally is focusing on uh, insecurity and, and focusing on the security sector, and uh, Professor Varoufakis, Varoufakis is focused on the economics. Um, and that's to be expected. I knew that that would going to be happening uh, all along. Um, eh, but uh, what I'd like to focus on is, is, is there a role in the system for instability? Is there some ways that instability can create good? Um, out of competition and uh, a notion of periods of great instability sometimes lead to great levels of innovation. Um, is stability, instability necessarily a bad thing? I'll turn that question to Ambassador Bolton first. Well, I don't, I don't think it's a question whether instability is good or bad. Instability is inevitable. Uh, the, 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 the periods of stability we've seen in the world come uh, through, throughout history have come in a variety of different ways, sometimes uh, because of an effective uh, uh, balance of power uh, and sometimes because of, uh, uh, of dominance of one power or another. But, but it's, uh, there's, there's been no example where uh, the stability is permanent, and it's a uh, uh, it's a it's a problem that uh, evolves and changes. To be sure, uh, 
uh, we've been in the 20th century through three great uh, uh, confrontations, uh, two hot world wars, one cold, one cold world war. Uh, that fortunately, the uh, partisans of freedom have prevailed in uh, each time, uh, but uh, but there's no guarantee. It's not that uh, anybody's seeking confrontation. It's the fact that others seek confrontation with us, and uh, it can come in a variety of forms. 9-11 uh, certainly took the United States by surprise. Uh, and uh, and it and it can happen again. I, so I don't I don't regard stability or instability as inherently uh, having positive or negative moral values. What I'm concerned about, and what I think uh, is the legitimate focus of decision making in the United States, uh, is how to protect American interests and values in the world, uh, together with those of our allies, against external forces that uh, that don't wish us well. Uh, of which. Unfortunately, throughout history, there have been a fair number. Uh, it was it was a privilege for the United States in its early days to avoid external confrontation, uh, largely to to seek stability in the Western Hemisphere. Although I think it's a mistake to call that isolationism, because while we were doing that, we are we were creating what is today the United States uh, as a country today, and for the last hundred plus years, that's had global interest, it's been our fate to uh, in, engage with the entire world and, and to provide, in my judgment, uh, as much stability as we could through networks of alliances and institutions, some of which have been more successful than others, but which uh, have, uh, have at least given those who want to join in the uh, a common approach that, uh, that we and many others hold. Uh, to, to see a, a stability or at least to create structures of deterrence against those uh, who would rather structure the world in a different way. Uh, and that may last, it, it may not last, it, it won't last by creating a Bretton Woods with China. We, we created, recreated one of the Bretton Woods institutions, replacing GATT with the WTO, and the Chinese are busy perverting it. So I think they've given their evidence of what they're up to. Thank you. Uh, Professor Varoufakis, um, I'll pose the question, but uh, what I really meant, and probably imprecise on my part, but I meant the outcome or the result of instability could be bad or good, uh, not in the stability or instability in, in their own manner being good or bad. And one thing I'm thinking about is the prospects of her innovation occurring due to competition, due to things like that. What, what's your take on that question? Well, my take, I suppose, is similar to yours. A healthy degree of uncertainty is the elixir of life. It's the salt of the earth. It's what keeps us creative and productive. Uh, but that's not necessarily the same thing as instability, uncertainty, right? Uh, what I fear regarding instability uh, are moments of catastrophic uh, degeneration. Uh, and of crisis uh, that leave us all diminished as a species. So for, I shall give you three examples. 1929, or I could have used 2008, but 19, 1929 is a more poignant example, where suddenly you have the, a cascade of, um, of insolvencies, uh, beginning in the United States, ending up in Europe, uh, in Japan, and effectively pushing humanity into a war of all against all, and um, you know, tens of millions of dead people. Uh, that is the kind of instability that, is, uh, that does not have uh, uh, beneficial effects. The, the second example I shall give is, for instance, uh, the invasion of Iraq. The invasion of Iraq was uh, a murderous uh, error which in the end all that did was it helped, uh, it was a mag magnificent uh, boost for Islamic fundamentalism, for ISIS, for misanthropy, for um, you know, m mass death and no serious, uh, n not no serious, zero benefit to anyone in the United States, in Europe, in the Middle East, anywhere. And the third of course is climate change. Um, we are moving now, we are already well past the, uh, the, the point of discontinuity the turning point, the point of inflection, if you want, whereby we are jeopardizing the future of the next generation. And that cannot be a good thing.
Um, so uh, we're now at uh, defining or maybe redefining what constitutes instability. So we have maybe gradations, if I may uh, allow me to kind of paraphrase what you're saying. There's catastrophic instability, then there's kind of systemic notions of instability and or instability and then there may be periods by which there's a global uh, some aspect of stability for the global system one could describe is that a fair enough characterization of your thoughts that, that's more or less it um, there is uh, uncertainty there is um, um, a, a kind of disequilibrium which begets uh, creativity, and that is always a positive uh, uh, force, a force for good, but that has to be managed at a macro level, whether you, you are talking about the nation state or indeed globally. And the whole point of the Bretton Woods institutions was to do that. Uh, the uh, emergence of uh, new forces like China uh, can either be seen as uh, an opportunity to you know, effectively go, go to war, whether it's a cold war or a hot war, or as an opportunity uh, to create a global agreement that will restrain the extent of the catastrophic instability. Okay, thank you. Professor or Ambassador Bolton. Um, what does that, I mean, you opened and talking about short term and then more systemic uh, problems in the international system, strategic, uh, strategic threats, uh, which result in insecurity and instability. Would you make differentiation between potential catastrophic uh, and then a, more of a <laughs> garden variety of instability and then periods where, or regional patterns of stability are evident in the globe? Is that a fair characterization that you could agree to? Well, I, I'd have to say, just uh, for myself, I'm, I'm not much into taxonomy. I, I don't, I don't uh, d distinguishing between strategic and tactical is about, about as taxonomic as I think you can get, because I think there's so much variability in the, uh, in, in the issues. Obviously, uh, some uh, threats uh, are significantly greater than others. Uh, uh, Russia as an economy uh, doesn't really have a lot to concern us. I've, I've heard by different measures, and I'm not sure we have good statistics from Russia or China, but the, the Russian economy right, right now is roughly the size of the Netherlands, uh, or maybe Italy. That's another, another comparison I've heard. Um, that that would not amount to a strategic threat under under anybody's definition. But when they have ten thousand or more uh, uh, nuclear weapons on hand, that that by definition makes it serious. But I, I'm a, I'm an admirer of Edmund Burke. I'm not not much of a follower of abstractions. I think I think you have to try and characterize the uh, the, the circumstances as you see them in the real world. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm going to change direction, maybe pursuing it a little bit. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, we've seen uh, amazing improvements in life quality. I mean, I began opening with COVID and we're seeing a disaster. But if we're taking a big, big picture perspective and in terms of global development, infant mortality rates have declined precipitously. Uh, malnutrition is disappearing more and more. Uh, it's going lower and lower every year. Um, we see uh, unambiguous trends in poverty rates improving, uh, that these things are actually bright lights uh, occurring that tend to be blinded because the news, a uh, bad news crowds out good news and gradual change in uh, the ability to get a bicycle instead of having to walk somewhere, things like that don't make the news. Um, to what degree, I mean, so the international system over the period that Professor Varoufakis has been talking about at a global level, especially in the poorest parts of the world, not the very, very poor, but vast amount numbers of people have been elevated out of abject poverty into uh, middle, lower middle class from a global perspective. Um, 
is this a sign of uh, possibilities of, of where the world works together or is that coming out of nowhere or where are those good things occurring um, out of bad? I'll let Pro Ambassador Bolton, or no, I'll go for uh, Professor Varoufakis first. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, I, there's no doubt that um, the globalization phenomenon, which I alluded to in my introduction, um, is uh, at the heart of the process that you described. Uh, the incorporation of more than one billion workers, one and a half billion workers, maybe two billion workers, into capitalist labor markets has created the, 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 you know, this um, magnification of incomes um, globally. But two points, if I may. Firstly, if you take China out of this equation, most of those uh, you know, positive and welcoming and particularly uh, joyous statistics disappear. It is China that has lifted the largest number of people to the greatest degree out of poverty over the last 30 years. We need to recognize that. As I said, if you take this, the, the Chinese statistics out of the, the, the global picture, the rest of the world is not looking as good. Well, the second Asia, point Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, is, India um, have made great progress. I mean, not as significant as China. Not really. Not really. Tiny, tiny. You would not be making this uh, you know, boisterous claim if it wasn't for China. And one might even add that the degree of development in places like Pakistan and like India, in, indeed, in the European Union itself, the way in which a country like Germany, the middle-sized uh, middle companies in Germany managed to weather the storm after 2009-2010, owes a great deal to Chinese growth. Whatever you may think about China, this is a fact. We cannot ignore it. And the second point I want to make is that, you know, we economists, and you are an economist as well, we tend to overestimate these things that can be measured and to completely underestimate or neglect values that are not measured, which can be even more important than the ones that can. Let me give you an example. Take the Aborigines in Australia. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extreme example, but to make the point in a short space of time. You know, when Captain Cook arrived in Botany Bay, they didn't have a single pound or, or, or euro or cent or whatever. And they lived very happy and fulfilling lives without commodification, without markets. Look at the Aborigines today. Today, you can see, because there is a welfare system in Australia, they have a very high income compared to what they had 200 years ago. When were they happier? Today, it is a community in dire straits. The same thing can be found in communities in India, since you mentioned India. Look at the number of suicides amongst Indian farmers whose income in monetary terms is going up, but whose lives is diminishing sharply. Look at the deaths of despair in the United States itself. The number of, of people who die unnecessarily from depression, from obesity, from diabetes, from, uh, from ill health that is a result of poverty within wealth. That is the worst way of being poor, by being surrounded by wealth. Same in, uh, in the European Union. We have so much unnecessary suffering, which is the result of a failure to take the tools that capitalism has created for us. You know, the wonderful machinery, the, the, you know, the robots, the, the, the new technologies, the new commodities, and press them into the service of human happiness. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Bolton, I'm going to push you a little bit uh, uh, to move in the economic sphere. Uh, I know that you began your career at USAID uh, working with McPherson. I actually had the pleasure of teaching a class with him together uh, when he was the president of Michigan State University. Um, but what I want to do is push you. I know that you have a law background, not an economics background, but b having been at USAID, a little bit more on your perspective on the question I asked and maybe a response to Professor Varoufakis. Well, I think, I think the record is pretty clear. And, and if it's not, I'm sure the professor will correct me. But, but 35 years ago, Deng Xiaoping, 
began uh, uh, an incredible transformation inside China, abandoning Marxist, I guess I shouldn't use that word, but that's what he would, that's what he would say. He abandoned Marxist principles. He said, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, but whether it catch, catches mice. Uh, he said, to be rich is good. And, and he stripped away policies that had, uh, that had been implemented since 1949 to cause enormous destruction, uh, the decentralizing control of the economy, uh, abandoning the mindset that had led to the great leap forward in the 1950s, which caused more human devastation than any other act in known human history. Uh, beyond war, beyond actual hostilities. Uh, he uh, tried to claw China back from the catastrophe of the proletarian revolution. Uh, and, and he had achieved substantial success across the board. And so the phenomenal economic growth in China, which obviously contributed to averages and levels worldwide, uh, was something that uh, I think you can trace almost like a laboratory experiment. What's fascinating now about China uh, is that beginning with Hu Jintao and now continuing with Xi Jinping, uh, all the evidence that I think uh, we can see is that they are uh, abandoning the reforms that Deng Xiaoping brought into place. They're re-centralizing control. They're uh, re-imposing uh, 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 constraints and um, uh, and limits on what Chinese and foreign uh, businesses can do. I, I think that that uh, will inevitably add to the social strains in China that uh, we still see flowing from the one child per family policy. I don't know how you measure one child per family in economic terms, but it was a disastrous uh, uh, concept and its full social effects are still being felt. So, so it, it's the the idea that uh, uh, that somehow we we that what we owe what we owe to China is Deng Xiaoping recognizing that Marxism was failing, and I think uh, and and I will speak as an alumnus of USAID. We've seen economic growth in so many of the countries that AID was present in in. Uh, the Western Hemisphere in South Asia uh, and and to Africa and a lot to a lesser extent, uh, unfortunately, uh, that uh, much of the world that Professor Varoufakis has described, uh, I, I don't I just don't recognize it. You want to respond to that, Professor Varoufakis? Varoufakis, sorry. Did you, you can't hear me? Uh, now I can. Okay. For the moment. Do you I want to briefly respond to his to his response, or, well, or I, I could I go shall, on. I shall attempt to agree. Yes, I'm, I'm quite quite happy to respond. Always am. Uh, I shall attempt to agree largely with Ambassador Bolton. Deng Xiaoping um, brought about the revolution that led to Chinese economic success. No doubt about that. And it was the jet, I agree with you, um, Ambassador Bolton too, that it was the jettisoning of the failed centrally planned system, call it communist, you can't call it Marxist because Marx never wrote about those things, but he, let's agree that he jettisoned the collectivist, centrally planned communist system of production. In that sense, he brought in a kind of you know, liberal free market ethos into China that worked very well. But there were three things that he did also that made it work. The first thing he did was he did not allow for the liberalization of finance. And that was crucial in helping China succeed. Remember, Franklin Roosevelt, I will take you back to Bretton Woods, when he convened the Bretton Woods Conference, he made sure, he, he, he actually stated one uh, term for sponsoring that global, remarkable conference that yielded two, two, two decades of you know, wonderful capitalist growth. And that was no banker 
no financier should be allowed into the Mount Washington Hotel. Remember that? That's also what Deng Xiaoping did. He said, if we want free markets, we cannot have financial markets running havoc and running amok. And that really helped. The moment China liberalizes its financial system, that is the moment when I believe the Chinese capitalist economy, or call it whatever you want, is going to go into serious spasms. The second thing he did was, or he, the government did, and after Deng Xiaoping as well, is to control tightly aggregate investment. The way in which they increase the boost aggregate investment, especially after the 2008 crisis, um, stabilized China and the world economy, and then deflated it a bit, then again in 2014, when there was another tendency for the economy to stall, increased it a bit. So this is macroeconomic management that they did, which the United States, courtesy of the way in which Congress and the White House often do not see eye to eye, uh, has not had the capacity and certainly not the intention since Franklin Roosevelt of doing, or maybe LBJ. And the third thing he did was um, he ring-fenced big tech. China is the only country that uh, features companies that can compete with Amazon, that can compete with Google. Europe cannot do that. We do not have such large corporations. And one of the reasons why various administrations in the United States, including the new one of President Biden, President-elect Biden, are um, confrontational with China is because they, it's very difficult to accept that there is, you know, an Amazon um, uh, competitor in China that the United States um, policymakers cannot find ways of incorporating in the Silicon Valley-based ba big tech, another kind of primitive accumulation rivalry between two superpowers that doesn't benefit the world. Good. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now is going to turn uh, to politics. Uh, I mean, we've been talking about politics at some degree, but I want to get into more domestic politics. Ambassador Bolton's raised a number of issues regarding human rights abuses and other aspects. Uh, I'm going to return to that thought, but what I want to do is turn to the illiberal turn uh, of the world, democratic backsliding that's occurred. Uh, more extreme cases are uh, Russia with increasing centralization of power since uh, Putin took power. We've seen increasing authoritarian tendencies in Turkey, in India, um, a number of countries, Hungary, Poland, where we see growth of illiberal democracies, if you will, a retreat from uh, civil uh, liberties and uh, human rights. Uh, basically, they're what some political scientists refer to as electoral democracies. Only the elected leader, but there's no uh, guardrails that would characterize uh, a liberal democracy. Um, what I want to ask about is to what degree does this illiberal turn uh, in these regimes, how does that uh, threaten global stability? And uh, uh, What's the future? I mean, is that a long time future or are those regimes basically so uh, based on strongmen that when that strongman is gone, they'll be inherently unstable and we'll have a new a possibility for a new regime or not? I'll turn now to Ambassador Bolton to address that issue. Well, uh, I, I guess I'd say a couple things. The first is uh, f f I, I think there has been uh, retrogression on the point of the uh, societies that have emerged from from totalitarian past, the former Soviet Union, former uh, Yugoslavia, uh, 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 among others. Uh, and so I think the the lesson to the first lesson to draw there is that uh, this is at least a partial refutation of the Whig theory of history. There's not an inevitable upward progression. It just doesn't go on in, 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 uh, uh, in sequence. You can have, as in the case of Russia, emerging from a totalitarian society, having a brief uh, experience with democracy, and then receding back into authoritarianism. And I think that's important to understand so that the idea that, that you can create 
uh, what is goes under the term of a rules-based international society uh, inevitably moves from sunlight to sunlight higher and higher. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that internationally. It doesn't work like that domestically. Now, in terms of what uh, whether or not there's a trend, you know, I, I'm I'm reluctant to draw sweeping conclusions from circumstances in different countries that uh, that that really are quite varied and uh, which may reflect uh, political configurations within those countries at a given time but which 10 years from now may be very different. I, I think there's uh, considerable discontent in Europe, discontent in the United States um, uh, that has been reflected in, uh, in, in politics in different ways. Uh, but I do think that, uh, uh, that, that this variation is, that does not strike me at the moment as being outside uh, the range within which democratic change occurs in in uh, in in our societies. So I don't uh, I don't really worry about it um, from a strategic point of view. And if I may say so, uh, with all due respect, I think this is more of a European concern, uh, and it's more of a European concern because of the strains on the European Union. Uh, more than strains, Britain has withdrawn from the European Union, uh, and uh, and and so I think that the 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 issues uh, within countries that are members of the European Union uh, reflect in the larger debate uh, going on within the Union itself. Uh, and I, I understand, of course, that this is incredibly significant for Europeans, and ultimately it will be for the United States. But it's a debate because of the circumstances and structures of the European Union that I don't see replicated elsewhere in the world. Aren't they somewhat, though, a threat with especially Turkey for NATO, which is definitely related to U.S. security? Well, I think we're in the in the in the course of trying to figure out whether Turkey wants to be part of the West or not. I mean, I think Erdogan has taken Turkey in a direction completely contrary to the uh, Ataturk Reformation post Ottoman Empire. Uh, I think he is fully prepared to abandon the secular nature of the Constitution that Ataturk wrote, uh, and I think he has, hard as this may be to believe. Uh, Neo-Ottoman aspirations in the Middle East. Uh, his decision to purchase the Russian S-400 air defense system is utterly unjustifiable, contrary to his uh, obligations in NATO. Uh, but here again, I don't necessarily uh, want to draw an ultimate conclusion from that. Turkey has another presidential election in 2023. If it's free and fair, underline if, underline free, and underline fair. Maybe the Turks will vote in a different direction, certainly. In last year's provincial and municipal elections, they did. Uh, so that's, I mean, Turkey is actually a good example why I, I worry about drawing uh, overly broad conclusions from insufficient facts. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn the question to you, Professor Varoufakis, uh, about uh, the rise of illiberalism in the globe. I think it directly relates to what you're talking about, internal uh, inequalities, uh, those who are the, those who feel like they're left out during periods of growth, things like that. Do you want to expand on that? Yes, gladly, Scott. <sighs> on a personal note, uh, because you mentioned that um, you know, your research interests include game theory as well as economics. I was a game theorist, minding my own business, doing rather esoteric things, not um, working substantially uh, on um, macroeconomics, on political economy, except as an active citizen. It was uh, around 2001 with the bursting of the dot-com bubble in uh, the United States that I started Wearing, And I started wearing as somebody, I mentioned that before, I'll mention it once again, who grew up in a fascist dictatorship. And the reason why I was wearing was because I started feeling that the way in which financial markets were being refloated by central banks, especially by the Fed after 2001, 2002, and the manner in which financialization was just going crazy. 
uh, was heading, was leading us down the path towards a new 1929, which unfortunately happened in 2008. The response of the central banks was different in 2008 compared to 1929, but the essence of the uh, post-2008 period was not that different to the essence of the post-1929 period. We had a massive collapse of uh, the capacity of the little people to imagine a future where uh, their kids would be having, you know, as good a life as they did. These periods of uh, cascading insolvencies, of home repositions, of you know, bankrupt um, banks, bankrupt um, labor markets, bankrupt uh, households, and bankrupt small businesses, which we experienced here in Greece. People experienced across the United States after 2008 for a while, uh, across the European Union. Um, the Russians experienced it massively uh, due to their own separate catastrophe. These are periods when humiliation, austerity, and lack of prospects and precarity combine forces to give rise to a political dynamic that boosts magnificently strongmen, those who, you know, stand on a soapbox and look at the little people in the eyes, the people who are suffering, the people who've lost hope, and they say to them, I'll make you proud again. I will look after you. I'll give you a little bit more money, you know, uh, a welfare payment here, a welfare payment there, okay? But I'll make you proud again to be American, to be Italian, to be Greek, to be British, to, to be German, to be whatever, to be Chinese, to be Russian. That is when democracy suffers. And we've seen this worldwide. Uh, lest I am uh, um, misunderstood, let me be clear of this. Vladimir Putin, He's a war criminal. I stood up and said so at the University of Athens Senate meeting in the early 2000s because of what he did in Chechnya. President Xi of China is increasingly despotic and the violation of human rights in China, even though I do not want to see us in the West foster a new Cold War with China, uh, I am never going to stop from um, campaigning for more human rights in Hong Kong, amongst the Uyghurs, the uh, Muslim minorities, the Chinese people, Chinese workers, and so on and so forth. So this um, rise of um, despotism, of um, dictatorial leaders, of strongmen, is the repercussion of the fact that we are living in the postmodern 1930s. Our generation is 2008, has been condemned to be relieving those uh, uh, political forces leading to the um, strengthening and reinforcement of political monsters. I'm not going to mince my words about it. And you see, this is why I'm interested in the economics. It's not because of some kind of ideological commitment. It is not because I'm an economist. It's because I fear for a world in which young people are going to be facing the double whammy on the one hand of climate catastrophe and on the other of precarity and democracies in which the stronger, increasingly the stronger players are those who harvest the seeds of, uh, of wrath and of anger that they plant. Well, let me take that last statement and push back a little bit. Um, so how would you say to respond to uh, the development of a surveillance state where the every, I mean, and the largest incarceration of peoples in known in history with the Uyghur population basically being in giant uh, prison camps, uh, the surveillance technology being developed. These are some of the things that Ambassador Bolton raised. How, how does the West respond to that? make any kind of accommodation of China, the new Bretton Woods process that I am proposing, conditional on human rights, the old-fashioned approach, uh, engagement, not confrontation. But you see, there is an issue here. 
And that is my great concern. I'm not so sure that the ones who wax lyrical in the United States or indeed in Europe about uh, human rights in China are that concerned about human rights. They're far more interested in Alibaba and other large big tech Chinese corporations, as well as the financial system in China that, would, that Wall Street and the city of London would love to get their hands on. Uh, I'm interested in human rights, and I would make it a condition for any kind of new Bretton Woods style arrangements that would benefit China. And the Chinese government wants, remember, it was the governor of the Central Bank of China, which in April 2009, in the G20 meeting, convened by Gordon Brown, was the one who suggested the um, International Clearing Union arrangements that John Maynard Keynes had proposed at the Bretton Woods Agreement. They want that kind of, not Marxist, Ambassador Bolton, but New Deal Keynesian accommodation. What we should say to them is, if you are interested in that, here are the conditions. Human rights across China and Hong Kong, as well as no more lignite-powered or coal-fired power stations. Thank you. Prof Ambassador Bolton, you want to respond? And uh, I guess more particularly what I'd like to ask is, I think you lay out, I think quite clearly, uh, the human right uh, foibles of China and a need to react to um, uh, in a certain level of assertiveness on the part of China in East Asia uh, and broader than that to Africa. It's not mentioned by you, but of course we know about that. Um, short of, uh, I mean, in conjunction, I would guess, with a, a response at a security level, are there other ways that you would, or you disagree, or do you uh, uh, support what Professor Varoufakis is saying? Well, if you wanted to have an experiment, let, let's take the WTO. I mean, it was in the post-World War II universe of organizations. You had the UN, the IMF, and what was supposed to be the ITO, the International Trade Organization, that uh, was never born. We had the GATT instead. We've, uh, we've uh, outlived the GATT. Now we have the WTO. China was admitted in uh, 2000, 2001. Uh, I remember well, uh, it was the universal cry at the time that this will help the reformers inside China. China will conform to international norms in the financial and economic world. It will make them more responsible. They'll be a responsible stakeholder. They'll engage in a peaceful rise. Uh, and I think what we've seen is that uh, over the 20 years of Chinese membership, they've systematically manipulated this theoretically pro-free trade organization by pursuing, with enormous success from China's point of view, a mercantilist foreign policy, uh, mercantilist economic policy. So, okay, here they are, deeply embedded in the WTO. Um, uh, so how exactly, now that they're in, uh, do do we use the leverage that we may have because of human rights violations or however you want to characterize it? You can you can do it on the basis of climate change and tell them they can abandon all their coal-fired plants. That'd be interesting to see. And when they tell us to stuff it, what do we do then? You want to respond to that, uh, Professor Varoufakis? Yes, I would, I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, and I shall respond uh, with two points. The first one is, there is no such thing as China. <laughs> In the same way, there is no such thing as the United States. We have such complicated, complex uh, economic, political system societies that you know, many, there are many Americas, there are many Chinas. There is, you know, the, uh, Ambassador Bolton, you, you mentioned the reformers. The reformers are still there. They're in China. And many of them are putting up a wonderful struggle for creating you know, more democratic rights, for um, uh, pushing China in the direction of uh, a greater accommodation with the rest of the world, uh, for liberating Chinese workers from the shackles of uh, the Communist Party apparatchiks. There is even a boisterous democratic movement within the different prefectures that even managed to unseat Chinese Communist Party officials. It is true that in Beijing, the central authority is becoming increasingly authoritarian. 
uh, but we need to engage uh, with the Democrats within China, and I would say the same thing, and I shall say this a bit later if I'm allowed regarding Turkey, we need to engage with the Democrats when the forces that are there and who are, you know, are really jeopardized and undermined by the cries in favor of a new Cold War against China. The second dimension that I think is important, and that's a more direct answer to Ambassador Bolton's point, uh, how to engage with them and what do we say. Uh, Ambassador Bolton, the World Trade Organization is a place that everybody manipulates, the United States manipulates, the European Union has repeatedly failed to um, subscribe to agreements at the WTO, everybody does it. But there are other levers that we can use with China. Uh, the Chinese political economy is facing a major crisis. It hasn't come yet, but it will come. They cannot simultaneously grow the way they need to grow to maintain political stability and redistribute income, money, from investment which is unproductive to internal consumption. For that, they need uh, an international project, an international agreement with the European Union and with uh, the United States in particular, that are, will allow them to rebalance the Chinese economy. That means fewer exports compared to imports. It means a number of uh, uh, moves in the, in the direction of liberalizing the, the Chinese economy without losing aggregate demand. Uh, at the moment, the European Union is exporting deflation to, to China because we are constantly cranking up exports to the, to the Chinese economy, undermining them. They understand that. They understand that a crisis is coming and can only be prevented if there is an agreement with the United States and the European Union. That, I think, is the way in which to manage um, a China that returns from the brink to, towards which the central government of Beijing is pushing the country by means of the increasing concentration of power in the hands of one man. Thank you. You actually took the question I was going to follow up with, but I'll turn that question to Ambassador Bolton. How sustainable is growing centralization of authority in China? Uh, is it sustainable and is levels of growth uh, the I mean, normal kind of assumptions are that at some point levels of income and there's too much invested in the system that people will demand uh, more liberal rights uh, in accordance with growing material wealth. Do you think that there's a sustainability or is it inherently instable there? Look, look, it was the basic theory from Henry Kissinger to Bob Zellick to the present that increased economic growth in China brought about by Deng Xiaoping's reforms would lead to more responsible behavior by China internationally, which has proven false, and would lead to increased democracy domestically, which is also false. Uh, so, you know, authoritarian societies can last a very long time. That's not necessarily as they say in financial statements, uh, past performance is no indication of future results. Uh, you can't extrapolate. But I, I would respectfully disagree with Professor Varoufakis when he says that democracy uh, advocates are still uh, flourishing in China. Two days ago, uh, my very good friend Jimmy Lai uh, was put in jail in Hong Kong again. And the authorities themselves say they're not going to let him out until his trial in April. I'm very worried Jimmy Lai's never coming out of jail. Uh, Hong Kong for China is one of the gravest threats that they face. Probably the gravest threat that they face is Taiwan. And so when I hear suggestions that we engage with China and try and work with them, ask the people on Taiwan what their view is. They just had another free and fair election where they said, we, in effect, we are not going to accept uh, the Beijing view of how relations between China and Taiwan are going to play out, because, among other things, 
we've seen what you're doing in Hong Kong. And I think the world has also seen how China behaved with the coronavirus pandemic. It is beyond dispute, I think, that China covered up what happened in Wuhan, covered up the extent of the epidemiological consequences uh, of the disease in China, covered up the extent of the economic influences, uh, and by so doing, impeded the ability of the rest of the world to deal effectively with the disease. There's so much we don't know uh, now that I'm afraid uh, we're, we're never going to get to the bottom of it. This is not a government that I'm prepared to trust with very much. Uh, and when, uh, when, when I say that, often it's met by reminding me of Ronald Reagan's uh, use of the Russian proverb, trust but verify, precisely the coronavirus experience shows the Chinese aren't going to let us verify. So you can't trust and you can't verify. I would rather take back uh, the reins of uh, our dependency on China. And I think, in effect, that's happening without conscious policy. I think people now see the political risk of doing business in China. Uh, is much higher than they realized. They should have probably realized it before. But on their own, without government direction, we're seeing an unwinding, a, a, a diminution at the margin of uh, increased investment, a, an unwinding of some of the existing investment, uh, because people will price in the political risk of dealing with the kind of government that we see in Beijing now. I'm going to change the subject and move away from China now. Um, uh, I'm going to actually, maybe I'm just curious on my own part. So loser's consent is an essential aspect of democracy. Um, so to what extent is uh, Donald Trump's refusal to concede the election problematic? And is there a long-term consequence, in your opinion? Or do you think this is a minor, another month and it'll go away kind of uh, thing? Well, I think, I think Trump is an anomaly and an aberration, uh, but that doesn't mean that he's not dangerous. Uh, it's uh, the reason that uh, I resigned from uh, being the national security advisor, one reason why I wrote my book, and the principal reason why, for the first time in my adult life, I didn't vote for the Republican nominee for president. I think the damage that he's done uh, to the United States internationally and domestically uh, can be repaired. I'm actually optimistic it can be repaired quickly. But I fear that if he had been elected for a second term, some of that damage uh, might have been irreparable. Uh, and we're going to have to face the consequences of uh, Trump uh, for a long time. But I do think that uh, the experience is a, is a warning. It's not a tendency. Uh, and I think that Trump himself uh, will go down in history as uh, the, as the worst president that we've ever had because of this overall reaction. Every day that goes on uh, diminishes his reputation and slowly, more slowly than I would like, uh, within the Republican Party, uh, leaders are beginning to say that as well. Is there a real threat to the Republican Party? No, I don't think so. I think this is a question of uh, uh, what's happening now, more and more people standing up and uh, acknowledging that, uh, that Trump is uh, conducting one of his worst offenses is a con on the Republican Party itself. Uh, I'm not defending this in any way. It's a, it's a tragedy that uh, Trump was ever uh, nominated for president or that he won. Again, I think the circumstances are uh, unique. The Democrats nominated probably the worst candidate they could in 2016, uh, and uh, uh, and and so we we have the past four years to deal with. Uh, there's there's damage to repair. I make I make no secret of it, but I don't think that he challenged the fundamental institutions uh, in a way that gives me pause. Look look at the record in court. Uh, the the judicial branch. And, and not just at the federal level, but in the states as well, the record roughly as of today, I think, is in his litigation challenging the election. He's had one victory and 46 defeats. Thanks. 
Uh, I'll let you join in, uh, Professor Verif Verifakis, uh, if you want to make a comment on this, on Trump and the non-concession, loser, the lack of loser's consent, if you will. Sorry, did you hear me? <laughs> well, very briefly, um, Donald Trump is a symptom. And he's a symptom of the Obama's, Obama administration's failure to live up to the expectations of those who, after 2008, expected a, a new deal from the Democrats and didn't get it. Instead, you had lots of left behind people. You had lots of held behind people. You had a lot of anger and a lot of discontent. And when you have this kind of discontent and anger, uh, people will vote for whoever they think is going to annoy uh, the well-off, the ones uh, who have a cushy job and a cushy place in society. And this is what Donald Trump did. He is um, weaponizing this discontent. He will continue to do so. Unfortunately, he has created a bubble of people who are convinced that he was robbed. And, you know, with every court case that he loses, uh, those people are even more convinced that uh, the system is against them and the system has robbed them of their democratic rights. And my great fear as a, as a left-winger, <laughs> now I'm going to characterize myself, uh, Ambassador Bolton. My fear as a left-winger is that the next couple of years will be a period of slump for the American economy because of uh, uh, COVID-19 after effects. And this is going to solidify the Trumpist uh, base within the Republican Party while splitting up the Democrats. Because Biden won due to the Bernie Sanders, uh, um, AOC, uh, Elizabeth Warren supporters that this time, unlike 2016, came out um, in force and, um, to vote for Biden. Biden now is liberated from the New Deal, from the Green New Deal. He never wanted it. Now he doesn't have to, to do it because he does control the Senate, and I don't think he will in any meaningful way. Uh, and the next couple of years, my, that, that, this is my fear. I truly hope I'm wrong, that, the, that Trump has lost, but Trumpism is going to take over the Republican Party even more powerfully, and we are going to have very negative repercussions for liberal democracy across the world. Ambassador Bolton, um, you want to make a comment about prospects for a Biden presidency along the lines that... Uh, well, let me... Yeah, I mean, in, in part, I think Professor Varoufakis has, has a point about the, the travails of the Democratic Party. But, but let me say first, with respect to the Republican Party, which is my natural home, uh, there is no Trumpism because Trump doesn't have a philosophy, doesn't indulge in grand strategy, doesn't really even do policy as we normally understand that. It is all about Donald Trump. Uh, and I think uh, what he has been able to do, and it's disturbing, I, I, don't, uh, I don't deny it, is that he has uh, persuaded a number of people, he's intimidated a lot of other people, but he's persuaded a lot of people that uh, that, as he said in the uh, 2016 Republican convention, only I can fix it. Now, th this is a dangerous statement to make, and it's especially dangerous for Republicans. Our, our party has always been one of policy over personality, uh, and that's why we're going to have to have a huge conversation uh, once Trump leaves the Oval Office, which he will at noon on the 20th of January. And once that happens, the political dynamic in the United States changes dramatically. For Biden, uh, I don't uh, envy him his task. I didn't vote for him either, by the way. I wrote in somebody else's name because I, I, I was not going to be happy with the Biden presidency for very different reasons. I, I think uh, Professor Varoufakis is right. I think the Democratic Party is uh, in grave danger of splitting uh, uh, as it attempts to govern. And I'm much more optimistic that uh, the Trump influence can be removed from the Republican Party if we win the two Senate seats in Georgia, we'll maintain control of the Senate, definitely not predicted before the election. And we've come within five or six seats of gaining a majority in the House of Representatives, an absolutely stunning result. So I think uh, the return of the Republican Party to a Reagan-esque uh, approach uh, is is something that with work we can accomplish. Uh, and thanks to the blue collar workers that Trump did bring into the party uh, and the uh, and the more educated, more affluent 
voters that he pushed out, which we can bring back, I think, uh, and given the travails in the Democratic Party, uh, I, th I think there's a period of uh, uh, substantial possibility ahead for the Republicans. I think Biden will be a one-term president. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn and I'm going to um, kind of take a point raised by Professor Varoufakis. Uh, and it kind of goes back to his initial statement about growing up in uh, the, the in Greece uh, and the period of uh, the dictatorship. Uh, to what extent? So your career has been a very consistent one, uh, advocating and supporting U.S. sovereignty, uh, ex uh, expounding for U.S. national interests. To what extent is there an inherent, uh, maybe there's going to be at some level winners and losers in the globe? And to what extent does that uh, focus on, is there a way to square that circle, whereas sovereignty doesn't necessarily create uh, losers or disorder in the global system? Is there a happy, ordered, focus which would still preserve U.S. sovereignty? Start with, with Greece. I, I, the professor, if I heard him correctly, said that he lived in, the, in Greece at the time of uh, following the fascist coup, which had been uh, inspired by the United States. I have to say, uh, that's the first time I've heard that. I didn't, I didn't know that was another one we should take credit for. Um, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not aware that we ever inspired a, a, a coup of any kind in Greece. But uh, 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 the the concern that I have for sovereignty is uh, is is not abstract. It's a it's a question about uh, who governs. Uh, and for the American people, sovereignty sovereignty has never resided in the government. Uh, you know, the very term sovereignty comes from the sovereign, the monarch. Uh, in that sense, is a is a European creation for us. Sovereignty is uh, is expressly stated uh, in the first three words of the Constitution: "We the people." That's where sovereignty lies. That's where legitimacy lies, uh, and uh, and frankly, that's where I'd prefer to keep it. Uh, I think our governmental institutions are problematic enough. We struggle in our domestic politics. We have our uh, arguments about the proper balance of power, the proper role and size of government. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, it's hard enough for us to, uh, to govern ourselves. Uh, in, in that sense, the United States remains a developing nation and uh, always will be. And I'm actually quite proud of that. But what I don't think necessarily follows is that uh, because of uh, in increasingly common problems around the world, that the solution lies in ceding sovereignty to, uh, to international institutions. And again, I think this is largely a European debate. Uh, uh, Europeans have gotten very used to ceding sovereignty to Brussels. That they're also very happy to try and get others to cede their sovereignty to, to something else. Uh, I don't see it that way. I understand. Uh, some of the origins of the desire for European Union, uh, with the the rise of uh, fascism in uh, in Germany and Italy, uh, in in the pre-war uh, period, but other other sovereign powers in Europe didn't fail. Britain didn't fail. Uh, so I, I don't I don't uh, I, I don't uh, I don't buy the argument that sovereignty is part of the problem. I don't think it gives winners or losers. I think. A sovereign nation like the United States, uh, through protection of its sovereignty, uh, has given its citizens uh, a measure of liberty and economic security never before seen. What, why would I want to change that? Professor Varoufakis, you want to respond to that? The nature of sovereignty. Before I, before I speak uh, to, uh, to, to, to the question about the Greek coup d'etat, let me say that I see eye to eye with uh, Ambassador Bolton on the question of sovereignty. Sovereignty is crucial, and it must be the sovereignty of we, the people, whether we're talking about you know, the other side of the Atlantic in the United States or Europe. Uh, there has been a tendency, and he's quite right, 
in Europe over the last 50 years of European integration to diminish the importance of sovereignty, to say silly things like, um, you know, we are pulling our sovereignty together because these days um, it's really not important because we live in an era of globalization where, you know, nobody's sovereign and therefore let's uh, at least agglomerate, you know, stick together in order to be more powerful in this world. And that is a major, major source of confusion uh, between sovereignty and power. They are not the same thing. You can have a tiny little nation like Iceland, which is sovereign. It's a country of 300, 350,000 people. Okay, they're not powerful, yeah. but the sovereignty that they have has proven crucial, for instance, after 2008, in uh, saying, no, we are not going to shift the losses of the Icelandic banks onto the shoulders of, you know, small businessmen, women, households, and so on. And they managed to avoid the awful fate of the Greek people, who, having ceded their sovereignty to the European Union, at least the monetary union, the Eurozone, could not do that. Uh, so I am a strong supporter, even I would go as far as to say I'm quite Burkean when it comes to the importance of, of sovereignty. The question is, uh, how do sovereign nations, how do sovereign governments collaborate with one another? And what kind of rules of the game do we want to institute so as to live in a good global society as opposed to a dystopia? Uh, and here I'm going to end uh, with um, a, a bit of news for Ambassador Bolton. Uh, on the 21st of April 1967, a CIA-sponsored coup took place in Greece, uh, and then another one in uh, the November of 1973. Uh, and you don't have to even believe me, President Bill Clinton, when he visited Athens, I believe at some point even apologized for this. There is no doubt about it. Uh, Ambassador Bolton, it was a very silly coup d'etat. It was a very silly thing to have done because it didn't serve American interests even. Uh, mutual respect of sovereignty and finding mutual agreements that are mutually beneficial amongst sovereign countries is the way to go. The Bretton Woods story, which I keep repeating, not because I'm a Marxist, uh, irrespectively of whether I'm a Marxist or not, uh, because those who created Bretton Woods, remember, were American patriots, mostly, and they would really balk if somebody called them Marxists. Uh, the beauty of the, American, of the Bretton Woods system was that sovereign nations came together and decided not to seek sovereignty, but to come to an agreement that would be mutually beneficial regarding capital controls, exchange rates, and recycling of surpluses and deficits. And I think this is what we need to do. And that doesn't require any ceding of sovereignty. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, that was the end of the debate section. So uh, you in the audience, the online audience, we've got a number of questions already. You're invited to write and submit questions, hashtag Holberg Prize, uh, and uh, you can submit the questions. So I'm gonna turn to some questions that have been brought by uh, the online audience. I guess under normal conditions, you would have had a dinner last night with us and there would be a live audience and people would be clamoring for a microphone, I suppose. Uh, but we'll take do it what we can here. Um, the first question I have here is for both of you, and it says both Bolton and Verifocus at times have played roles of outsiders, not always deciders, but building new ideas, breaking old ones, creating space for change, is that correct? Did you regard yourselves as outsiders uh, in your careers? And was that a time of reflection and development uh, and forcing you in new directions or not? Um, and do you recognize that in each other? I'll turn to you first, Ambassador Bolton. Uh, well, thank you. Well, sure. Uh, you know, look, uh, my first... Uh uh, political campaign uh, uh, as a 15-year-old uh, high school student was for Barry Goldwater for president in 1964. Uh, and uh, he got whomped in one of the, the worst landslides uh, uh, in American history, uh, but didn't, uh, didn't change my view that, uh, that he had been correct uh, philosophically and uh, 
uh, I continued along that road. I went to, uh, I'm a child of the 60s, I'm a baby boomer, and I got my undergraduate uh, education at Yale. If, if you want to consider being an outsider, consider being a conservative at Yale. In the in the late 1960s, but uh, you know, as the saying grows, I think it it uh, builds your character and uh, and uh, gets you ready for the larger debate. Thank you, Professor Varoufakis. Well, I am I'm an accidental politician. I never wanted to be one. Um, I, the only reason why you're looking at me as a politician today is because Greece went bankrupt in 2010. Uh, the state and then the banks and the whole country. And uh, unfortunately, we had governments and the European Union uh, bureaucracy, um, an oligarchy that insisted on giving our country one, our country, our government one credit card after the next, pretending that we are repaying our debts under conditions that were catastrophic for the private sector, the public sector, everyone. And uh, you know, at some point, after having. Um, uh, written a lot and spoken a lot against uh, that inanity that both leftists and rightists could agree was a crime against logic, not just against our society. Um, at some point, um, I was invited to join the government as a minister of finance and I got elected with a very large um, percentage of the vote in my constituency. Um, and the rest is history. But th th because I was an accidental politician, um, I wasn't really interested in being a minister. I was interested in getting a job done, that is, restructure the debt, to get the people out here um, out of debtors' prison. And the moment uh, my prime minister went away another way and signed on the dotted line of another credit card application, I was out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question. It's a question for you both. Um, and it's as follows. Is Turkey a source of regional instability? And why should Turkey remain in NATO? Uh, you started to answer this, Ambassador Bolton, about a decision on the part of Erdogan. Uh, you want to follow up on uh, as a source of regional instability. You kind of alluded to that with creating a neo-Ottoman empire and things. But I'll, I'll ask the question. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, Tur Turkey is a source of enormous uh, instability. Erdogan is a follower of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he he is he's provoking splits within the Muslim world. He's come very close to uh, uh, open warfare with uh, with the Syrians. Uh, he's one of the key factors in the uh, ongoing struggle in Libya. Uh, it's a. I, I don't. I don't yet believe that Erdogan really represents where the Turkish population wants to go. As I said earlier, that's why I'm looking forward to the 2023 presidential election. But uh, if he continues down this path, uh, including purchasing advanced weapon systems from from Russia, uh, he will de facto, if not explicitly. Uh, have separated himself from NATO, from Europe, from the West as a whole. I, as I say, I don't think that's where the Turks themselves want to go, but we hope that they'll have a chance to make that decision uh, in, in the next uh, national election. Professor Varoufakis, uh, at the risk of asking a Greek about <laughs> Turkish uh, instability, but uh, you already made a comment about you could take up the theme later. So this is your chance to take it up about uh, where to move on. I mean, right now, uh, France has become involved in conflict involving Greece and Turkey, uh, long-term prospects in Turkey. Um, uh, could you address those issues, please? Well, I thank you for the opportunity to do so. <sighs> Turkey has been an unstable regime for a very long time. They have a history of coup d'etats, one after the other. And every time a regime in Turkey feels uh, insecure, the up the ante, the increase the tensions in the GNC with us here in Greece. Uh, we are, in, in other words, as, as a Greek, I have to say that um, Turkey presents a clear and present danger for um, peace in the region in a way that Greece doesn't. Our position has always been defensive. 
maybe because we are the much smaller country, the much smaller population, uh, and the country that has a far less need to export instability through aggression. Uh, having said that, Erdogan, I remember, has been ruling for a long time now. Uh, I agree with Ambassador Bolton that now he's in a, minor, a minority. The, thankfully, the majority of Turks uh, have turned against him. And the more they turn against him, the more paranoid he, is, he becomes, the more the tensions that he builds up across the region. But at the same time, one has to say that he's a great beneficiary of United States policy. It was the invasion of Iraq that effectively destroyed almost every regional power, including Egypt, uh, and left only two countries standing as potential representatives of uh, the, the, the Muslim world, Iran on the one hand and Turkey on the other. And Turkey has used that under Erdogan, the Erdogan regime, not Turkey, but the Erdogan regime has used this in order to project power beyond the borders of Turkey in a very efficient way. This is not a compliment, this is just a realization, um, a recognition of a fact. Uh, he is winning uh, skirmishes or wars or conflicts in uh, Azerbaijan, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in uh, Libya, uh, in Iraq, in Syria. And that is allowing him to stabilize the inherently unstable regime within Turkey. Speaking as a Greek politician, it is essential that the rest of us reinforce to the extent that we can our Turkish Democrat friends. They are the ones that will have to overthrow Erdogan. They are the ones who will have to turn Turkey into a source of stability in the neighborhood. Uh, the European Union is a source of instability. You mentioned France. Look at what is happening in Libya. You have France supporting one of the warlords, and you have the European Union, nominally at least, on the side of the recognized government in Tripoli. You have you know, German business uh, actively involved in the Turkish economy. Therefore, the German chancellor will never contemplate sanctions against Turkey, whatever Turkey does in the Aegean. And at the same time, you have Italian and French interest uh, moving in the opposite direction. The European Union, um, you know, if you put the words European, foreign and policy together, you end up with a very sad joke, unfortunately. So what I think we should be doing, and this is what our party, Mera 25, is proposing in the Greek parliament, is that the Greek government should call for an Eastern Mediterranean conference, call the leaders, including Erdogan, to sit around the table, not in order to agree, but at least to sketch on the same map uh, their demands regarding exclusive economic zones, regarding um, the, the manner in which the Eastern Mediterranean must be divided up. And then take this, agree that we're going to take this to the International Court of The Hague. Uh, I'm not saying that this process would lead to peace, but what I'm saying is that instead of siding with France versus Turkey, um, creating these debates within the European Union which are divisive and effectively aid and abet Erdogan, uh, we should uh, call for a diplomatic solution that involves all member states of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and let Erdogan say no to this. This is going to diminish him in the eyes of Turkish Democrats, in the eyes of the Turkish people who are in the long run our best allies in turning Turkey from a source of instability to a source of democracy and stability in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. This is a question uh, asking just for Ambassador Bolton, uh, so I'll, I'll ask it. You, this is quoting from the online uh, questioner. You said in January 2019 that, quote, it will make a big difference to the U.S. economically if we can have American oil companies really invest in and produce the oil capabilities in Venezuela. To what extent do the interests of U.S. oil companies determine U.S. policy on regime change? 
Uh, they, they didn't determine policy. The, the oil company we were most concerned about and remain most concerned about in Venezuela is Citgo, where, there, where the Maduro regime continues to hold uh, a number of Citgo representatives and, uh, and the damage they might have done uh, to Citgo in the United States. Uh, as a result of, uh, of U.S. recognition of Juan Guaido as the interim president. Uh, what I was referring to there was the, was the clear opportunity, if the Maduro regime were, uh, were forced to recede, uh, for American and other companies, uh, there would be an enormous opportunity to refurbish the incredibly devastated Venezuelan uh, oil infrastructure. Uh, under 20 years of, uh, of socialist rule by Chavez and Maduro, Venezuelan oil production uh, went down to a level that today is below the level Venezuela produced in 1946. I just think about that for a minute. Here's one of the potentially richest countries in the hemisphere uh, because of corruption, because of the uh, the mismanagement uh, of uh, Venezuela's oil infrastructure is just crumbling in front of the people. They, they could see it. That's one reason that their standard of living has declined so significantly. So a Venezuela that could elect its own government, a freer Venezuela, had the possibility of bringing in uh, not just American oil companies, but whoever, whoever was interested in bidding to rebuild that infrastructure and recommence re, uh, uh, production of Venezuelan oil, oil, which would have a tremendous positive benefit for the people of Venezuela. And I'm sad to say, and I, I regret to this day that we weren't able to overthrow the Maduro government because he's a authoritarian uh, and the people of Venezuela uh, have suffered, suffered badly for the last 20 years. Professor Vera Focus, you want to respond to that? The question was for the ambassador, but uh, I'm going to let you address the question too. Well, firstly, let me say from um, a climate change perspective that the optimal uh, oil production level is zero. Uh, we are past the times when oil was a source of wealth for, for humanity. Now it's a scourge. It is jeopardizing the future of uh, this planet and the species on it. Uh, regarding Venezuela, Ambassador Bolton, I wish that I lived in a world where we could all unite to allow the Venezuelan people to decide their fate, not to have this discussion as to whether you know, one power or the other should overthrow a regime. Because I, as I said at the beginning, I live in a country where we have had regimes being overthrown, and it was actually democratic regimes that were overthrown. Um, I do not believe that it occurs well for global stability to be using the language of the coup d'etat as a means of introducing liberalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to move on to another question, and this is for you, Professor. Uh, some of the greatest existential threats to humanity depend on the innovation and technological advancement that follow from capitalism, including the climate crisis. By opposing capitalism, are you not also making it harder to come up with solutions? Well, I'm not opposing capitalism. Capitalism is opposing capitalism. <laughs> the greatest enemy of capitalism is not the left. It's not left-wingers like myself. Uh, we are a pathetic lot. We have never managed really to undermine capitalism. Capitalism is doing really very well despite our best efforts to undermine it from the political left, right? Uh, but it is capitalism that generates the technologies that undermine itself. It is capitalism that is generating the huge cartels that destroy competition. The Amazons of the world today, the standard oils of the 1920s, the techno-feudalism that we now have. Uh, consider this, Scott. Now, we have a situation where you know, we have had a massive hit, both on demand and supply, internationally. And the financial markets are doing really very well. Why? Because they are completely and utterly dependent on public money printed by the central banks. So you've got a financial sector that is um, doing very well, thank you, courtesy of the state, 
that's not exactly a liberal capitalist situation, right? It's a kind of usurpation of capitalism, while uh, you know, small business, medium-sized business, people actually doing stuff out there are having a horrible time. So this disconnection between financial markets and small businesses, the way in which you know, the American dream that we all had once upon a time, that you know, our kids would be better off than we are, and that we were better off than our parents and grandparents, that has gone for uh, the, the vast majority of people in the West. Uh, this is no longer the case. Uh, hard work has been decoupled with poverty alleviation. Uh, and therefore, you see that capitalism is already morphing into something else, something that bears no relationship to the writings of Adam Smith, the idea of the baker, the, boor, the brewer, and the butcher, you know, who on the basis of competitive markets are producing our, and supplying us with our daily bread, uh, meat, and lager. Instead, we have platform companies that resemble many Soviet unions like Google, Facebook, and Amazon to, to save democracy, to save markets and competition we need to oppose that morph, morph, morphed version of capitalism, that which is the evolution of a capitalism that now doesn't even resemble the vision that pro-capitalist great thinkers put forward. Okay, thank you. Ambassador Bolton, you want to comment about the role of capitalism and technological development? <laughs> Look, 1776 was a very good year. Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. The United States declared independence. The two have gone hand in hand together. Let me just say about capitalism, and, and I, I, don't, I don't want to make it an extended debate. Capitalism is about freedom. Capitalism isn't some philosophy that's imposed from outside. Capitalism is what Aboriginal peoples all around the world did. Some grew food, some did other things. They exchanged products. This is this is uh, uh, this this is the way people live, and uh, and and the idea that uh, that that somehow uh, the, the the these fundamental human urges uh, are going to be transformed by governmental action into something else, whether it's for climate change or, or, or any other objective, uh, I just think is, uh, is fantasy. I have another question for uh, Professor Varoufakis. Um, what is the relevance of Marx's analysis, the way governments across the world handle the COVID-19 crisis? Not much. But not even neoliberal analysis, because you see, the problem with uh, these um, grand systems of thinking is that they are particular um, formulations for particular uses. Uh, what was the relationship with, within the thought of Karl Marx and the Soviet Union? Zero. Zilch. If Marx was alive in the 1970s, he would have probably been a gulag. Uh, what is the relationship between Adam Smith's Wealth of the Nation that Ambassador Bolton mentioned and the capitalism we have today? Zero. If you work as a warehouse worker in a roboticized process of production or distribution, to be more precise, um, you're not free. You're a slave of precarity. You live and work under awful unhygienic conditions that you accept because you don't have an alternative. Uh, and by the way, Ambassador Bolton, uh, I find your definition of capitalism very interesting. Aboriginal societies did things together. There was division of labor to some extent, but it was exactly the opposite of capitalism. It was based on common ownership. It was based on common ownership of the land. It was based on gift exchange. It was precisely the opposite of the private concentration of wealth, of ownership of means of production that we have under capitalism. Uh, but what the, 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 the main lesson that I would like to draw attention to regarding COVID-19 is the way in which, I mentioned that before, I'll say this once more. Look, something remarkable happened on the, on the 12th of August, last August, in London. At 9.05 in the morning, there was the announcement that uh, the British economy had tanked, absolutely tanked, because of COVID-19. You know, more than 20% loss of GDP, that had never happened in the history of Britain. 
And what happens 11 minutes later? The stock exchange goes up by two, two and a half percent. Why? Because we don't really li uh, live in a kind of free market capitalism of the kind that Adam Smith and Ambassador Bolton are referring to. We are living in a state capitalism where the Bank of England was immediately assumed to be printing lots of money to give to the financiers. While the little people out there continue either to uh, not be able to, uh, to, to make ends meet or to worry about where their jobs are going to be going the next day. Professor or Ambassador Bolton, um, I'm not going to ask you about a Marxian interpretation, and uh, I think actually the answer kind of ends that one. Um, but I am going to ask you about um, uh, the response to you made. You did explicitly mention failures with the response to COVID-19. Um, what what would you? I mean, if you could rewind the clock or take a time machine back to January uh, 2020. Uh, what policies should the U.S. or other countries impose? What can we learn from countries that have handled the pandemic well, say New Zealand? I mean, it's an island uh, and there's the abilities there, but uh, what lessons can we learn from the South Koreas, the Taiwans, uh, the New Zealands, other things? What could the U.S. done differently? Well, South, South Korea is experiencing a substantial spike now. I mean, I think the real lesson derived from Taiwan and New Zealand is be on an island and be able to seal yourself off. In the United States, the, the failure initially was, uh, was Donald Trump's uh, unwillingness to listen to what he was being told as early as January. Uh, and this has been reported in the New York Times and plenty of other uh, li liberal uh, media sources. Uh, he was told in early January that the that the risk uh, was very significant that coronavirus would come out of China and have a very uh, uh, deadly effect on the United States, certainly medically and quite possibly economically. Uh, and he simply would not hear it. He wouldn't hear it because he didn't want to hear bad news about his friend Xi Jinping. He didn't want to hear bad news about the effect on the Chinese economy at the same time he was trying to sign a significant trade deal, which he did later in January. And most of all, he didn't want to hear bad news about an impact on the U.S. economy, which he at that time saw as his ticket to re-election. So uh, despite some relatively minor steps, uh, roughly three months went by before the United States took it seriously. Uh, and then the response was essentially a shutdown, which uh, which tanked the economy uh, 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 almost immediately. Uh, Trump, during this entire period, and we're now almost 12 months into it, has not yet, and he's obviously not going to, develop the strategy. He has never thought comprehensively about what to do when he created the potential mechanism within the U.S. government to do that. Uh, the uh, coronavirus task force chaired by the vice president, uh, he made sure it didn't work by attending its briefings in the White House press briefing room because it was great airtime for him until, until what was left was pieces of the U.S. government doing what their normal mission would be and the states and local governments trying to do the same. So, uh, you know, the answer is uh, you, you need to start back at the very beginning. I, I think uh, the, the steps, the sometimes contradictory steps that the United States took show there was no comprehensive thinking about it. Uh, and I think some of the steps were over-inclusive, like the uh, continued effective lockdown of the economy. And some steps were under-inclusive, with public health officials at the beginning saying there's no need to wear masks, incredibly, uh, as we look back on it. So there, there was failure in many respects. I think the main failure starts with the president. You know, you all know, I'm sure, Harry Truman's famous sign uh, on his desk in the Oval Office, the buck stops here. Trump would never think of putting a sign like that on the desk because it's always somebody else's fault. Uh, but, but I think uh, if, you, if you have to look for root causes, not, not taking it seriously at the beginning and not thinking through uh, the necessary steps, uh, uh, I would put right at the top. Hopefully, the vaccines that have begun to come online will uh, will be the solution to the problem. But but that's still six to nine months away. When at least within the United States, they would take uh, their full effect. 
so we have we have a long way to go and I think a lot more pain to experience. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, we're now running close to the end of our time. So I'm gonna say, how about two minutes each for closing comments? Uh, and then uh, I think we'll be pretty much out of time after that. So I'll turn first to you, Ambassador Bolton. Uh, if you could final remarks for about two minutes, please. Well, I think it's uh, it's uh, very important as we come out of the coronavirus experience uh, in the U.S. and Europe, really around the world, uh, that uh, that that we re-examine uh, what went wrong and uh, uh, and try and do some preparation in advance for it. Uh, it's a uh, it, it's an experience that uh, I think we didn't have to go through uh, with the severity uh, that we did. But I will tell you that every terrorist group and rogue state that uh, that watched what we did uh, is thinking about uh, why they want biological weapons. Um, uh, we have files from al-Qaeda in Afghanistan uh, after the overthrow of the Taliban that show they were thinking about nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons then. Uh, that's why the proliferation of these weapons of mass destruction has always been a priority of mine, and I think now uh, along with the nuclear threat, the biological weapons threat uh, is very imminent. Uh, the world will be a dangerous place in the 21st century. Uh, the world's probably always going to be a dangerous place, but the way that you uh, deal with the threat is not to ignore it and not to say that we can find uh, mutually beneficial ways of uh, overcoming these differences. The way to deal with it is to have adequate structures of deterrence, uh, to deal with the threat uh, until it disappears. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Varoufakis, two minutes, please. Well, in the spirit of um, your choice of uh, debaters today, I suspect the reason you chose a European, uh, maybe a Southern European, and an American speaker is because you want, from Norway, where you are, uh, to bring together the two continents to have a discussion about the future of the world. Uh, so in my closing statement, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring out climate change, which uh, hasn't featured much, but bring it out as an example of the kind of peril that we face. Because just like climate change, global security, global poverty, financial stability, Public health, especially during a pandemic, these are collective problems, are humanity-wide problems that require collective decisions and collective action. The United States, after 1944-1945, has played um, a very significant role and um, often a very positive role in helping bring together the nations of the world uh, in a degree of harmony and with some efficiency, especially in the 1950s and 60s with Bretton Woods. I do believe that Europeans have two duties. One is to unite within the European Union, properly to unite, to create a proper political union so the Americans can actually you know, call someone with authority. <laughs> and secondly, to elicit from the United States a new readiness to come to terms with a new multilateralism, a new internationalism, a new international solidarity that deals with these global threats as a common enemy. If we don't, if we fail to come together as Europeans and globally, internationally, I very much fear that we are going to be on a perilous road to a barren future. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Very much appreciate it. And you're right, there are so many themes we didn't touch upon. Uh, climate change being a very important one that we really didn't adequately touch. There's many, many topics, of course, that we couldn't deal with. I want to thank you. Thank you very much for watching and thanks for the questions. Appreciate it. Welcome and thank you from Holberg Prize Debate. Thank you.